Welcome to another edition of the Deals for Dennis podcast. And today we have Ben Cotton. And Ben is the Director of Sales and Product Application for Cobalt Analytics. Thanks for joining us, Ben. Thank you for having me, Eric. And you're zooming in from uh, Atlanta, Georgia? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, about 40 miles due north of downtown Atlanta, a little uh, okay. a suburb of, of Atlanta. Okay. If you go to dealsfordentist.com, you can find Cobalt Analytics promo offer, which is mention Deals for Dennis and get 10% off of pretty much all their services, uh, their profitability analysis and PPO and negotiating services. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. So, um, so tell me about Cobalt Analytics and uh, how you help dentists. So we we look at naturally we we are in we negotiate for for PPO contracts for dentists, but we also like to look at the entire PPO mix, UCR fee for service mix, kind of holistically, uh, because it's not just about the negotiation part. There's other situations where naturally the UCR standard fees could be raised in some cases. Uh, in some cases, there's you know, the PPO contracts that might be advantageous for the practice owner to terminate or drop a PPO insurance, or maybe even add a profitable one that they don't currently have. And then there's also situations where the, the UCR or the standard fee is actually less than what insurance would reimburse. Therefore, uh, in those cases, practice owners are leaving money on the table and we're able to, to find those and quantify what all that means to to the practice owner. Um, I think what's kind of the, the big difference is other than looking at the entire picture of the PPO mix for the practice is it's also, we also look at it from the prop net profit perspective, net profitability of the actual insurance plan. So it's, you've got the revenue or collections, but factoring in the expenses for the practice. So when we analyze PPOs to start with, to get a baseline for a practice owner, we're actually, we know what the revenue portion is and we know the percentage of that insurance to the entire practice, but we also know how much money the dentist is making off that particular insurance plan. Okay. So there's now, how, a lot of information for sure. Well, it's, it's a big puzzle. I mean, yeah, dealing with absolutely. insurance companies is, is, is a big puzzle and um, you know, it's, there's so much that goes into it. I mean, it's, it's different if you're just opening up an office from scratch, if you're, your practice been around for, you know, 40 some odd years, like mine has, um, if you're opening up another location, there's just so many factors that go into dealing with insurance companies and, and PPOs and in-network, out-of-network. Um, so let's start with, um, how you got into dentistry and, um, um, and, and cobalt analytics. So about seven years ago, I was in surgical device sales and I got recruited into uh, essentially practice management consulting. I uh, knew really nothing about dental app. You know, I knew some of the scientific terms, <laughs> anterior, posterior. I knew where some of the teeth were. I, you know, had a kind of an understanding of occlusal and buckle and what all that meant, but knew nothing about the, the business side of dental, uh, but got recruited in and kind of had to kind of had to go trial by fire, not completely, but in a lot of specific situations that dentists face, um, whether it's leadership, uh, motivating their team members, uh, associates, selling practices, all the different accounting pieces. So I kind of, I learned a lot of the, the, um, the outlier things that dental practice owners deal with as I went. And so um, along the way, I always used, you know, I, I heard Dennis talk about, oh, you know, my insurance plans, I, I don't understand them. Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm working my tail off and my write-offs are terrible. Um, so I, I did as much as I could to help them in those cases, but I didn't really have all the tools I needed to really make a difference. So about six months ago, uh, about mid-summer of 2020, uh, I, I found a, a company, uh, through by happenstance on a LinkedIn post and did some research. It took a lot of time to do some due diligence on how they, how they ran their business and the thoroughness and, and, and how, they, how they did things and helped dentists. And so um, I started talking to them and, and um, about four or five months ago, joined them formally 
uh, which is, of course, it's Cobalt Analytics. And um, here I am now. So that's, well, that's kind of been my journey. You know, you, you talking about how you knew very little about, you know, the dental lingual uh, buccal posterior lingual. I mean, that was that makes two of us because when I got out of dental school, I didn't know anything about dental insurance. And, you know, you should have seen the first day when, in my first job, and, you know, in real world pri private practice, I had the office manager of that office sit me down and talk to me like I was a five-year-old because I didn't know what PPO, out of network, in network, fee for service, I didn't know what any of those terms meant. And then write-offs, I mean, so I was like, wait a second, so that $2,000 crown is actually really $1,100? Where does the other $900 go? Um, so, um, you know, it's just a whole nother, another, one other enormous thing they don't teach you in dental school. So, um, you, you really learn along the way that getting involved with, with PPOs and in-network and it's just one major volume discount. You know, you're, you're getting these patients, you know, in the door, but, um, you're playing by these PPOs fees and rules and, um, it's, um, you know, you, you learn you know, throughout your years that um, this isn't, you know, dealing with insurance companies is, is not for everyone. Um, and it causes a lot of headaches and stress um, for the dental office. So um, can you explain your process? Um, let's say, you know, I'm a dentist, I'm either opening up my, my first practice, or I've been in practice for, you know, several years. And I, I just feel like I'm working hard. I, I I'm, I'm in network with, you know, some insurance companies, there's patients coming in the door, but I just, I just feel like I'm not as profitable as I should have been. What's your process? Do you start with a, a fee analysis and, um, and then go from there? So uh, the, the, we start with the process. We, of course, do, uh, we like to use Zoom to do consult with the dentist, just to, just to, to explain to them how we operate, because how we do operate is a little bit different. Uh, than some, uh, you know, some of the other firms out there that do negotiating. Um, so we wanna get a feel for what the practice owner's goals are. Where are they in the stage of their practice? Is it a, is it a startup or you know, have they been open for a year? Uh, are they looking to add an associate? Because that can change the picture and what needs to happen, or at least that's a variable that's very important. So we wanna talk with a dentist, understand where they're coming from, the variables that are involved in their office to start our actual business process when we engage with a practice, uh, the first thing that we're gonna do is collect a bunch of data. Uh, we typically do that through remote access as long as the practice owner is okay with that. Uh, that actually makes things easier for the practice uh, or for, the, for the, their front desk gurus, but we collect a bunch of reports out of their practice management software. We collect all that data, we put it into our own patented system that we have our own software system that we have. And of course, some of, the, some of those unique variables to that practice. And about three weeks later, we're able to pump out kind of their baseline. We use a kind of a dashboard. It's got a bunch of graphs on it. Um, and it just notes, it notes the profitability of each of their insurances. So that, you know, that's our analysis part. And there's more to it that it's just not enough time on podcast to, to explain it all. So that's the analysis part. Once we get, once we, finish our analysis, like I said, takes about three weeks. Then we get back on, you know, on Zoom, uh, at least right now it's been through Zoom um, with the practice owner and go through everything with the practice owner. So there's a mutual understanding of what the current picture is for their practice. Along the way, we're making recommendations to the dentist. You know, here's where all your, here's where all your insurance plans stack up. Here's your UCR fee analysis. That's certainly a piece of, of, or the UCR standard fee analysis, that's certainly a piece of the analysis part. Here's where your insurances would pay more, but your, your standard fees are not, you know, they're, they're not as high as the maximum allowable for, the, for these codes. Once we get through that, we lay out kind of the strategy moving forward with regards to negotiation. So, you know, it, depending upon the practice and how, how many plans they have and which plans they are, which networks, you know, you've got connection, you know, networks like Connection and, and Dynamax and several others that that really can make things a little bit more complicated. And we've got to understand how all those pieces of the puzzle are, 
are are affecting you know the reimbursement rates for the for the practice. So we want to go through all the analysis part before we start negotiating, before we actually go to uh, you know helping the practices negotiate. And then after that, it's just a matter of helping them implement uh, any any um, any fee schedules that come back that are better, and helping them make sure that they get they get put into place like they should. Okay, so you essentially start with consultation, uh, you know, get the goals of the office, because my goals of my office may be very different than the, the office down the street that just opened up. Um, you know, the, like a new scratch office, maybe just looking to get butts in the chair any way they can, and that could be through um, more PPO and network participation. Um, whereas in my office, we're actually trying to um, target more fee for service in our membership plan. Um, so, and also, you know, where you are, you know, um, rural, urban, suburban, um, am I a boutique office? Am I a high volume office? So, you know, these are all factors that um, I'm assuming go into your initial consultation. And then where I'm at now, what are my goals, you know, two, five, 10 years, 20 years down the road? Am I bringing in an associate? Do I plan on slowing down, um, downsizing the office. So do you take all of these things into consideration and then kind of create a treatment plan from there? Absolutely, absolutely. The associate part, they're planning on adding one or they had one, but they're looking for another one. Uh, that definitely plays into it. Uh, it's all about patient flow from our perspective or not all about that, but that's a big piece to it. Uh, for example, you know, when, when we get our information, uh, we like to look at the schedule. We like to look at, say it's a general dentist. We like to look at the hygiene schedule two weeks from now and six or five months from now, just to take a look at it, um, just to see how full it is. Uh, naturally, we can't really do much about no-shows and cancellations. Uh, we understand how, you know, we understand that picture, but we're looking at the schedule. Also looking at the doc schedule, you know, the restorative schedule. Is it, is it booked out? three and a half weeks, or are there open holes tomorrow? Uh, that can play a role in the recommendations to, especially when it comes to with what you're trying to focus on in your office right now, which is, you know, trying to increase the fee for service side. Uh, that, that, yeah. can, that, can, that comes into play certainly when, it, I mean, it helps us, it helps us recommend uh, maybe some differences or, or, or maybe possibly dropping a, a plan uh, when maybe we would be a little bit more apprehensive to do that if we knew that the dentist was trying to grow, was about to add an associate and the schedule is, has a ton of holes in it moving forward. Okay, so let's say my, my schedule is slammed, I'm booked up. Um, what's like the sweet spot? Is it like, like you said, three and a half, four weeks? Um, you know, if you go even beyond that, can I start, really start to think about maybe dropping some PPOs? Um, is that I, I, I would say all things being equal, uh, you've got, you've got a, a practice that uh, the doc schedule that's got holes in it. Uh, there's time to, to uh, book more treatment four days from now versus, you know, the, the schedule's booked out three weeks, two different offices. Uh, yes, uh, when you've got a practice that's booked out that far, three to three, to three and a half weeks, uh, that tells us that their schedule is full and, you know, how else are they going to do more uh, if they're not planning on adding an op or adding another dentist? How are they going to do more? It's, it's, that's, uh, it's, it's much easier to recommend that they take a real hard look at, 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 at dropping uh, some of their least profitable P, uh, PPO plans or at least going out of network. Yeah, I mean, in reality, you know, being in network with PPOs or you know, even worse HMOs, that's your biggest overhead. I mean, that that forty percent write off is is your biggest overhead. So if you're if you're maxed out, if your chairs are full, um, you you feel like you're not as profitable, then that's when you really want to take a good look at dropping you know some of those um, non profitable PPOs. Um, so let's say I. I, I do want to take that jump and I've, I've decided um, 
to first, let's say, uh, negotiate um, that, uh, you know, that we've done our fee analysis um, and uh, we've um, looked at the net profitability. How, how does it work when actually negotiating with some of these insurance companies? Um, because I can't just call my colleague down the street, right? Because that's considered a collusion or a conspiracy. Um, you need a third party company like yourself to actually help you get some leverage and, and some negotiation, correct? Uh, yeah, I don't think you would want to call. Yeah, you wouldn't want to call your buddy down the street. Um, I, there are some offices that negotiate that the office managers negotiate mm -hmm. uh, themselves, uh, which that's absolutely doable for them. So they can do that. Uh, having a third party, uh, it reduces the time and effort for, for the front office person. And you've also got all the math behind it to try to figure out mm -hmm. how much better is this negotiated fee schedule? How many times do you keep going back to the insurance? How far do you take the negotiation? Um, you know, when you've got an unprofitable or, or the uh, a, a, a insurance plan that is the least profitable, maybe, not maybe, you wanna to wanna to take that a little bit, you're gonna be a little bit, um, more diligent, uh, a little bit more aggressive with that negotiation. Meaning that if we can't get it better by this much, then it's terminated. Well, how much better does it need to be? I think when it comes to, the, it's, it's not that, uh, I mean, there's certainly plenty of office managers that can negotiate on their own and certainly know, know how to do it. It's just a matter of maximizing the effect of the negotiation. Now, when you say, ter uh, you know, terminate the plan, does that mean you're going out of network or is, is, is that the, you know, do I still have to, um, or can I just totally drop the insurance company? What, what's the difference between like totally dropping an insurance company and going from in network to out of so network? When, when I say drop or terminate, I'm, I'm speaking of the contract. Okay. The contract. So the, you know, um, Delta Dental, uh, when you contract with them, you agree to, to charge the patient the fees that Delta Dental says that you charge the patient or bill the patient. When you're, when you're out of network or if you terminate that contract or you drop that contract, you're essentially going out of network. Okay, I see. I mean, you can shoot, I mean, any practice owner can, you know, if they're out of network, they can say, hey, you know, uh, patient Mrs. Smith, you know, we don't even, we won't even file your insurance benefits for you with X insurance. They can do that if they want to, yeah. but that's not what I mean by drop or terminate. When I say that, it's more about going out of network. I see. Now, why did you say some, some companies like Dentamax um, are, are diff more difficult or more challenging to negotiate with? Is that just because they're so large? I, I didn't mean that they're, they're harder to negotiate with. It, it makes it more complicated because Dentamax is essentially a network for multiple different insurances. So you have, you have situations, and we see this all the time. I actually just saw it this morning uh, for a practice in Alabama where the, the practice has two networks, Connection and Dynamax, but they're also directly contracted with some of the same insurances that are involved in those networks. So the big point in, in this case is for this particular practice is assessing which one which one's better? Because a lot of times when you have a network, but you're also directly, when you have a network that leases out the insurance, say for MetLife, but you're also directly contracted with MetLife, a lot of times what gets reimbursed back to the dentist is the lower of the two fee schedules. Like if connection, if the network is a higher reimbursement than the direct contract, then they'll pay on the direct contract or vice versa. So understanding that picture and how it and how it works for each office is it, it it can get extremely complicated so does a dentist have a choice like can i go for example like metlife just have a direct contract with them uh versus uh under the umbrella of one of the network um companies like Denimax? They can in some cases and again it's in some cases every insurance is a little bit different so uh you know, you can with some of the networks, you can opt out of some of the of some of the leased insurances that are underneath that network. Some you can't. 
Okay. It, it so makes it much it makes it much more complicated for sure. Okay, I wanted to go back to that that fee analysis. How many dentists out there do you think just haven't analyzed their fees in in years or their just in general, the net profitability from these insurance ins insurance plans? Is it is it more a higher percentage than you think? That's a great question, Harry. I, with regards to their standard fees, um, I would say there's a lot of offices that will do, they will research. Uh, they'll, they'll either ask their buddies down the street what their standard fees are. I've seen that quite a bit. They'll get, a, they'll get somebody in there to help them what, what their standard fees, whether it's their shine rep doing a DPAT or uh, it's somebody that uses the NDAS data. We use Fair Health. Uh, for when we do our standard fee analysis. Um, so what percentage? Uh, I, I'm just going to, it's kind of hard to say. Um, I would, I think four to five years, uh, I'd probably say 50% of offices haven't even looked at their standard fees in, in four to five years. With regards to the profitability of insurances, I don't know of any offices that look at the actual the net profit of their, their fee schedules, uh, of their insurance fee schedules, uh, because there's not really anybody that's looking, that's doing that. Um, I mean, I know we are, but we have a patent on the process to do it. So um, now they're looking at write-offs. That's the biggest thing I hear is with my write-offs. And I think that, you know, when we get into the conversation about write-offs, write-offs do mean something, there's, that's for sure. Just because your write-off is X amount, does that, what does that really tell you? I mean, if you can have your standard fees, whatever you want. Right. My understanding of write-off is the difference in between the standard fee and whatever insurance contracted reimbursement is. So if your standard fee for a crown is $1,800, like it is, you know, not too far from downtown Atlanta, and, you know, X insurance is paying 900, that's a huge write-off. Uh, if your standard fee is lower, it's not as much of a write-off. So um, with regards to the profitability side and what, you know, this insurance is, you know, 20% profitable in my office as a whole, I don't know of anybody that has, or not many offices that have assessed that yeah. uh, before. How often do you recommend doing the, the fee analysis um, or net, profit, net profitability analysis? Uh, standard fee analysis, um, you know, I like to say every year, but I mean, I'm just being, <laughs> being logical. I, I would say two to three years, you yeah. know, there's some, some practice owners will just raise them 3%. You know, that's, you know, that can work sometimes or sometimes it's could be ill-advised. It just depends upon the practice um, with regards to profitability side. Uh, it'd be great to do it as, at an ongoing basis because the mm -hmm. situation is always changing. You know, you, you, if you have, let's say you have Blue Cross Blue Shield and all of a sudden you get 40 new patients in, in two months uh, and those, those patients are, you know, you're, you're doing more fillings on those patients than you kind of were before on average, then that's gonna change profitability picture. Because we know from our experience, and I don't think this is any secret, that fillings, in general, just in general, no matter how profitable the practice is as a whole, fillings most of the time actually lose money. When I say lose money, the, the cost, the time to do it versus the reimbursement, the cost to the practice is higher than what, it, what, it, what they actually make the dentist um, in reimbursement back. So most, the most of the profit is from crown and bridge or implants, uh, some of the bigger ticket items, but um, not from fillings. Not from, well, yeah, and again, and, and the whole insurance picture changes that too. And each yeah. insurance is different for sure. Yeah. Now, is there, would you say, is there like a good mix? Um, so I'm in a suburban town. Um, you know, we're about 30 minutes outside of Boston. Um, it's a community, um, pretty well-educated. Um, middle class, you know, for my type of practice, is there like a good mix, would you say of, you know, in-network, out-of-network, fee-for-service, membership plan? I mean, right now we're, we're about, I'd say we're about 50% uh, 
you know, in network, um, the rest is either at a network or um, part of our membership plan. Is there like a, you know, like a, a good mix that you typically want to strive for um, as a, a solo practitioner? Oh, that is a tough question to answer. I think it all depends. My favorite answer is it depends. Mm -hmm. There naturally different geographies. Sometimes they're more insurance driven than others. Uh, I've noticed this in like, for instance, in Utah, mm -hmm. Utah is heavily insurance driven. Uh, if you compared uh, what your fees are compared to Utah, you would just be sick. Uh, mm -hmm. At least that's been my experience. Uh, Georgia is there's a little bit less pressure, I feel like. Uh, I see a lot of offices in Georgia that have about five PPOs. They don't have 15. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I mean, 50% 50 fee for service is great. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, I commend you for that. Uh, I don't think that there is a perfect answer. I think that if I were a practice owner, I would be trying to get as close to 100% fee for service as I could, period. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, it's just because you're, you're essentially not working as hard or not spending as much hours and making the same income, if not more. Yep. Uh, I would strive for that. And it's not about, you know, doing a disservice to, to patients that have insurance. Uh, it's about how the patients feel in the practice. So uh, it's a great question, uh, Eric. I, I'm, I'm not sure each geography, you know, where, you know, what the goal would be. Um, in my mind, the goal is to be as much fee for service as possible. Fee for service meaning out of network. Yeah, I think that would be, you know, the ultimate goal. Um, and, you know, not be dependent on, on, you know, insurance companies. However, uh, you know, when you're coming out of school and you're $500,000 in debt and you're, you know, you're opening up an office, you just got to pay those bills and get patients in the chair. And, um, you know, no better way to do that than, you know, by signing up with, with insurance companies. But it's like signing a deal with the devil. You got to play by their rules and their fees. And um, ultimately, if, you know, if you're a young dentist and you can, build up that patient rapport and that patient trust and build relationships, then maybe you can start, you know, weeding these plans out and retaining these patients. Because that, I, you know, to me, when I talk to dentists, that's the biggest fear is losing patients. If I, if I drop a plan or if I go out of network, am I going to lose patients? How many patients am I going to lose? Um, and I've read it's a, it's only actually about, 10 to 15%. It's not as much as you think. If you have, if you build that rapport with, with, with patients and you build that trust and that, that relationship and you get the staff on board and you get everyone on the same page and, you know, with a clear message and educating the patients of the reason why, um, and, and to start that message early, I, I hear it's actually not that much where, uh, of, of attrition. So, all right, yes, and and you know, back to back to like I said, if I were a practice owner, I would be as much fee for service as possible. Naturally, if I was a practice owner or most practice owners, and you've got, let's say, you're a dentist, you did, you've had had your practice open for three years, you're doing everything right on the internals. New patients are going up. You're holding on to your to those patients. You've got good patient retention. At some point, you should you should be able to start to look at weeding them out, like you mentioned. Absolutely. Um, and it's fairly easy to do if you know how all your insurance matches, all your insurances match up. Uh, you start weeding out the ones that are the least profitable. Uh, with regards to um, patient retention, when an insurance contract is, is dropped or terminated, uh, I, I'm, on your, I'm, I'm on your side on that. Um, you know, there's a lot of practice owners, I think, that are worried that they're going to lose all their patients. Well, first of all, you know, you're not going to, they're not going to lose them all. It really does depend on what you said, which is the amount of trust and rapport that they've built with those patients over the years. It also matters when they do terminate, how, how they communicate that to the patient. Uh, what do they, what do they say? Um, a couple of years ago, I worked with an office here locally in Atlanta where 
they wanted to knock off the only, um, or, or knock off, they wanted to terminate the only insurance contract they had, which happened to be uh, DD. <laughs> and, um, and so we helped them do that. Uh, and so it can be done. Uh, I realize that certain geographies, it's a little bit different. Um, there's a little bit more worry. Uh, I'm with you. I, I would say a good rule of thumb or a good average if a practice wants to use it is they will retain probably 60, 60% or 70% of their patients. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it, but again, that's a variable thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know some offices would retain more. Some offices might retain, they might lose more than that, than 40% than of their patients. So yeah, I mean, if you I, just, I don't have the data to be able to say that for a fact. I don't know if anybody does. Yeah, you if you just get up and pull the plug on some of these insurance companies and, and go out and network and you don't kind of set the tone of that culture and get that message and educate the patients, you, you may lose more. So you got this isn't something you can just do casually. You got to plan for this. Yes, you do. Um, Absolutely. Uh, you certainly don't want the patient to hear about it from the insurance company before they hear about it from you. Yeah. That's, you're all of a sudden as a practice owner, that's number one. All of a sudden your, your office is non-existent on the uh, insurance company's website. Um, you know, that's, that's not a good way for the, for the patient to, uh, to find out. Um, did, did you find that a lot of more offices were going out of network during COVID and, and, and after COVID? Whew. That's tough to say. I think there's there's a push on either side. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, the the offices that their schedules were full, the practices that were doing well, it was easier to do that. The practices that had major issues, uh, already had issues with a ton of no shows and cancellations. Uh, they were having trouble filling their schedules to begin with before COVID. It's going to be harder for them to do that. Um, with regards to, yeah, it's, you know, on, on our side of things, we've seen the same, the same two different things going on. We've had some practice owners that are worried about spending money. They're looking at, you know, what we do and, you know, what we charge as an expense rather than investment. But then there's some practice owners who are like, oh my gosh, you know, my, my reimbursements, uh, the fees that I'm getting, they're more important than ever because my patient load while my schedule's a little, is, is fairly full, we're having to take a little bit more time. We can't see quite as many patients. Uh, it's more important than ever. Uh, so it's, it's been interesting uh, that I, I've, we've seen, but I've seen both sides of it, of the coin and, when it comes to how practice owners feel. Yeah, we, we, during COVID, that was one of the silver linings where we actually had the chance to, to drop, um, and go out of network with some of the plans. And now we're down to two, two um, in network. Um, what, what's, what are you seeing out there? Like, are there some dental offices that are taking dozens of, of insurance plans or, or um, in network with, with dozens or more? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, you know, I think it goes back to the, 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 the practice owner mm -hmm. and how much, uh, you know, are, do they have, do they understand what's going on in their practice? Are they paying attention to it? Um, you know, some practice owners like yourself, you're paying attention to it, right? Uh, naturally, you've got a business, you're, you're thinking about the business side. You've learned that or you had it, you know, before you even became a dentist, you kind of understood that, uh, that it's just to pay attention to it. Um, and you're doing the best you can with it. You're slowly you're doing it the right way you're you're slowly weeding them out um, you're looking at that some practice owners don't they don't look at you know they don't even look at ar um so it's just a matter of and that's just how you know it's how people operate uh other physicians in general are like that too uh my older brother is an orthopedic surgeon and he is very business savvy but there's other orthopedic surgeons they just they don't even care to even, you know, understand their own insurances and how they, how, how they affect them. So um, it's just, it doesn't mean that there's anything severely wrong. Uh, it's just how practice owners, you know, look at it and their different level of what they're comfortable with business-wise. You know, we're, so we, we're in network with two, but we're, we, we are, you know, out of network with, with multiple insurance companies. So I'm just thinking, you know, 
you know, the more insurance companies you add, you know, the more, you know, complex it can get. And the more I feel like I would just feel like I would be losing control um, mm -hmm. over a good grasp of, of the office. And then count in all the staff hours that's spent on verification and on the phone with these insurance companies. I mean, you know, patient benefit breakdowns and, um, and all of that. I mean, that's just so much time and energy spent. Um, but, you know, for some practices that may be, you know, fine for them. They're a high volume office, they're adding associates or they're growing or they're multi-location and that may be perfectly fine if that's their, you know, that's their philosophy. Um, so tell me about um, Cobalt Analytics um, and you mentioned uh, the, the, the um, unique software you, that you have. Um, uh, can you tell me about, um, you know, why it's so unique and um, um, is that something if I, if I sign up with Cobalt, do I have a version of that software on my desktop um, or is that just something you use to, to analyze uh, the profitability and, um, and help me make a plan? Um, can you explain that? So to answer the last part of your question first, uh, the software that we have, we initially designed it for us <laughs> mm -hmm. internally. Uh, and we still use it internally, uh, but it is available for dentists, practice owners to, uh, they can sign in, give them a username and log in, uh, and they can sign in and go look at all of their information on it uh, and play around with different scenarios themselves. Mm -hmm. So the uniqueness of it is, it is, and of course, I don't have a copy of it to show you, but it's, it shows every single fee schedule uh, in the office and in a bar graph setting where it is profitability wise in relation to the app and to the net profit of the entire practice. So yes, we are, at, we are getting a PL statement for a practice. We have to, uh, that's certainly a piece of it. Um, noting the revenue of, e of each insurance and how it stacks up with each one of, with, uh, with the other plans, uh, that, that means a whole lot when it comes down to uh, what's going to happen in the negotiation or what are the results from the negotiation so they can see that uh, we also look at the profitability or the net profit of each procedure they do for every single fee schedule they have so for instance you know a 2391 2392 um, 0274 uh, for every single fee schedule that they have so our we do go with that in that depth uh, you know, I realize that some practice owners love that. Some practice owners, it doesn't really matter to them. Like, you know, I don't need to know the individual profit of my procedures, uh, of every single procedure. Uh, I noted that maybe Howard Ferran mentioned that uh, on a podcast you did probably about six months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, again, some practice owners want to look at that. Uh, some practice owners doesn't really matter as much, uh, but we do provide that information. Uh, they are able to go in and, and adjust how much time it takes them to do procedures and see how that affects the profitability of those procedures if they want to. Uh, it's, it's all tied, it's tied to that. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if it takes them four minutes or five minutes to do a doc exam and they said, oh, I wonder what, it, what this would look like, the profitability of, of my, you know, 0210 um, would look if it took four minutes, mm -hmm. you know, they can, they can test that out. So to speak, yeah. and it's not suggesting that we're saying, "Hey, you're taking too long to do procedures," but that is a piece to the puzzle that determines uh, the profitability of of the actual procedures that they're doing. So, uh, yes, they do have access to it, uh, and the uniqueness of it is that we include the cost and the expenses in our analysis. That's that's the patent that we have um, that is active. Um, our CEO Chris Taylor. Uh, he started that as dad's an endodontist and he, you know, figured all this out a few, about five to six years ago. And he said, well, you know, he was trying to include the, the cost into, and to figure out what the actual profitability was mm -hmm. of procedures and the, and the insurances. And so um, he naturally, it's, it's something that's a little unique. So he went and got a patent for it and we're certainly glad he did. Uh, it's, um, it's certainly unique to the industry as a whole. So could I actually, because I mean, I, I have nine operatories in my practice and there could be nine different procedures going on. 
with nine different, you know, insurance companies and each one of those rooms, you know, is totally different, you know, based on the procedure that you're doing, the, the insurance company, you know, the profitability, or even if you're doing the same procedure, let's say with nine different insurance companies and the same, op, you know, the same procedure going on in these operatories, the profitability could be totally different for each, each chair going on, um, you know, per procedure and per insurance company. So um, I think from there with that, you know, like you're saying with that software to see the net profitability of these insurance companies, some of them just may not be worth the squeeze and it's time to, you know, start looking at um, dropping the, the lowest uh, or the least profitable ones. Um, now, how, how does it work? Do you have, uh, does Cobalt have different packages um, for dentists or is it just, um, is it customized for each dentist? How, how does that work? So we, we mainly have two different packages. I, I, I actually, I should say three. Uh, the two different pieces of what we do that are, they work together, but they're also could be individual. Uh, are the analysis part only, just the analysis, not negotiation, and then there's negotiation. They could be lumped together. Uh, actually, most of the time they are because the analysis supports the negotiation. For us on the negotiation side, we can't do the, we can't maximize the effects of negotiation without having the analysis part. I mean, we can do our own, we can do our own calculations, but it, it really helps to, to have the, uh, our, our, our analysis part. I, I mentioned earlier, our, our, uh, we use that software internally. That's when we built it, that's what we built it as. And slowly, and slowly uh, we are making it more user-friendly for practice owners, but it was built initially for, for our own internal. So we, if we take, if we have a negotiated fee schedule, we can just put it straight back into the software and it spits out exactly how much better that negotiation negotiated fee schedule is. So there's two different pieces, really. There's the analysis and the negotiation. They work hand in hand most of the time. Every now and again, we'll have a practice owner that says, well, I don't, you know, I just want to, I just want you to negotiate. Okay, well, we can do that. It doesn't happen too often like that, but we can do that part. We also have some practice owners that they just wanted the analysis part. And that's it. Uh, so we can do that separate as well. Okay. Now, does it, does it differ for uh, how many, you know, plans I am in network with versus how many offices or locations I have, um, you know, for someone that's a, a solopreneur, you know, one office that's accepting um, in network for five plans versus another dentist who has 10 offices and they're in network with dozens of different plans. Is it more expensive? Uh, how do you, how do you base your, your pricing uh, for your packages? Okay. So yes, a uh, single practitioner uh, with 10 PPOs, five people, the number of PPOs doesn't matter for us mm -hmm. on, on, but the, the, the practitioners in the number of offices is, does play a role. Mm -hmm. Naturally, if there's 10 offices, yeah, there's, there's going to be a lot more involved because uh, we like to look at it by the office, not as a group of offices, at least on the analysis side. On the negotiation side, it, that can, there can be some variability there. Uh, so yes, uh, if, if a, a dentist, if there's one location that has like six or seven practitioners, maybe they're multi-specialty as well. Uh, yeah, that, the fee will go up some um, for that. Uh, our, we don't, we don't really start adjusting the fee unless there's more than three docs or three, three practitioners involved in a single office for multiple offices. Yeah. We like to look at it by the office because each office is going to be different. Right. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't mean that we charge the same amount for every office. You know, we'll, we're, we're going to give a little bit of a break for, for a group for a, a group practice where they have multiple offices, we'll give a little bit of a break for the second and the third and the fourth office. The fifth now, do, ever they have. Do insurance companies, do they set their fees based off of, of zip code or, uh, you know, di I'm sure different parts of the country are, are different, rural, suburban, urban. How, how does that work? How do, how do insurance companies typically set their contracted fees? 
So there is certainly some, uh, there's different opinions on this. Uh, mm -hmm. There can be some mystery on this as well. I uh, we know that uh, there are some algorithms that insurances use themselves uh, based on demographics, uh, different ge ge uh, geograph geographic areas can be very different. Uh, we see this all the time. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, you know, it's no secret that it's typically the contracted fees in Alabama are lower than somewhere like North Carolina. Um, it's just just how it works. Delta is, is, is the same as well. So how they set their fees, uh, it's demographics uh, for the most part. Uh, and in the geography of, of where they are. That's kind of the, the typical way that we've seen it. We've seen it and happen, but there's still, you know, uh, there's still some, there's a little bit of mystery there too on and, exactly and there, how they do it. Is there a power in numbers? So for a DSO that has, you know, 900 offices versus, you know, a small mom and pop practice, you know, in, in somewhere uh, rural is, does that DSO just, have so much more leverage in, in negotiating? I, I think this, it, it, does, it does matter. Uh, mm -hmm. Doesn't mean it's 100% of the equation, but it does matter. Uh, we see that it, it, it helps if, even if a practice in, um, in, in an area that if they're doing, you know, two and a half or $3 million in revenue, uh, they do tend to have a little bit more leverage than an office doing four hundred thousand dollars in revenue. Now, is is negotiating a one time thing, or do you do it? You know, try to do it yearly, or or how does that work? Uh, you can do it yearly. Uh, from our experience, it, it doesn't mean that insurances won't negotiate every year, but the chances that they will negotiate every year is diminishes. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if, you know, if you negotiate with an insurance a year later, you go back to them, the chances that they're going to say yes is lower than if the practice hasn't negotiated in, you know, a few years for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, like I said, it doesn't mean that they won't. It's just, you know, from what we see, it's not, uh, it, it, it doesn't happen as often. Okay. So let's say, you know, I've, I've planned this right. I've, you know, I've, spread the word to the staff. I got the staff on board. We started this early with, you know, the educating the patients and I, I'm going to pull the plug. Um, you know, in my office, we have our own membership plan. Mm -hmm. Can you help an office um, with setting that up? Um, or is that part of your services as well? Because it, I find it to be such a great thing to have. It's such a great alternative for patients that either, you know, don't have insurance, they lost their insurance, they retired, you know, they're a small business. Um, so I find it to be such a great alternative to, to keep the patient in the practice. Um, do you help Dennis with that as well? So we, I, I agree. First of all, I agree that in office dental plans, dental savings plans, VIP memberships, whatever you want to call them, they're phenomenal. Uh, you know, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, you're helping out the patients that don't have insurance, and you're also hopefully showing patients that are on insurance that what you have is actually better for them in a lot of cases. So we don't actually help practices set the in-office dental plan up or market it. What we do is we help them price it where they want it to be. Because mm -hmm. what, what, what and this, is, this has happened a lot recently. Um, with some offices that have clear, that use clear for their in-office dental memberships. Um, we're able to go and, and take a look at what they have, how they're, how it's set up, the pricing, um, you know, the yearly fee or the monthly for the preventative that they have, as well as the discount on the restorative procedures or whatever else. And we take that and we're, we're able to put that in as a, as one of their, in, almost like one of their insurances. Right. and note where it lines up versus all their insurances mm -hmm. uh, to at least the first thing we want to do is show the dentist where it stacks up. Yep. It's way down the totem pole, you know, below half of their insurances. Well, if I'm a practice owner, I want to know that because in my mind, if I have an in-office membership plan, I want it to be as high up on the, on the PPO insurance spectrum as possible. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not going to be there at, at, at the level of standard fees or UCR, but 
you know, you, you know, it's a dance there. Um, mm -hmm. You want to make sure that the patients want to sign up with it and you're a little bit price conscious, but not a ton. Um, therefore, it's, it, it's not maximizing what, what the practice owner wants it to do. So we, we analyze the, the in-office membership plans based on the pricing solely. And we'll yes, give us recommendations on, on, you know, if they were to change their in-office dental plan pricing, this is what it will do. Okay. This so is how you're, much you're, more profitable it would be. So you're helping um, guide them and you're almost pretending like it's uh, and you know, almost like an out of network um, insurance plan. That's um, exactly right. <laughs> That's how we assess it. All right, Ben, thanks so much. Again, Ben Cotton, Director of Sales and Product Application at Cobalt Analytics. And you can go to Deals for Dentists and find their promo offer, which is 10% off of their profitability analysis and negotiation, um, which is pretty much 10% off their services. Um, ben, th thanks so much for joining us. That was really informative. Thank you, Eric. And, and thank you for what you're doing for the industry. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing more about your book soon. Okay. Sounds good, Ben. Let's be in touch. That sounds good. Take care. Okay. Take care. All right.